on Thriving with Risk, which and with my esteemed panelists here. I'm really delighted. I'm Gunjan Sinha, Chairman of Metric Stream, uh, to be conducting this session here on Thriving on Risk. This is a topic which is very near and dear to me as the founder and chairman of Metric Stream, a company which has been a global leader in risk management. I've been thinking about risk for the last 20 years, and it's my pleasure today to have esteemed panelists here to be able to share my thoughts and to also hear their perspectives on how the world should think about thriving on risk. To just set the context, what I would say is that if you think about risk management, this has been a discipline which has been around, but never before has the value and the importance of risk management been so uh, acute and real right now. When you look at risk from various perspectives, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it is from the perspective of financial or operational or even digital risk, you know, uh, coming across, but also with the onset of environmental, the climate risk, the social uh, inequities, uh, social injustice, and the role of governments and businesses coming together, the risks are multiplying and businesses and governments have to pay attention to it. And as corporate citizens, we have to play our role in making sure that we know how our corporations, our governments and our society learns to thrive on risk. And I look at the risk as a maturation framework. At the beginning or the start, you start to think about how you manage your risk. That's when you start to at least acknowledge that there is risk. You know, whether it's you're looking at security risk, whether you're looking at financial risk, or whether you're looking at climate or environmental risk. The second phase of development or evolution is when you go from managing risk to embracing risk, where the risk becomes part of your business operations, where you start to think about risk not so much as a deterrent, as a problem, but also as something that you can actually make more risk intelligent decisions at the front lines, not just at the corporate or at uh, select group of people who are focused on risk management, but also people who are, you know, doing their day jobs, but at the front line when people start to make risk aware decisions. So that's the second phase when you start to embrace risk. And finally, I, I look at the third phase of evolution of risk is what I call thrive on risk, which is a topic today when you start to actually thrive on risk, because now you're turning risk into an advantage, into a strategic advantage where you're quantifying risk where you're trying to understand how that quantification can lead to you turn that risk into a comparative and a competitive advantage for your organization or your government or your, or your stakeholders. And that is really where the future is. I feel most companies now have to move away from moving away from just attending to their shareholders, but they have to move to the duality of profit and purpose where they have to submit themselves not just for the cause of the shareholders, but also broad stakeholders, including the society, the communities in which they serve, the employees, the workforce, and all of these, these uh, the changes in the stakeholder map is actually changing the way companies are now operating, where the boardrooms are now incorporating these views into the future. So to bring this discussion to life, I'm gonna kick it off with first our esteemed guest here, uh, Andrea Boni Blanc. And she needs no introduction, given she's the CEO and founder of GEC Risk Advisory, uh, which is a global risk ESG cyber and crisis strategy consulting firm. And she has done a lot of independent ethics advisory and financial oversight management for various firms across the globe. She has spent over two decades in C-suite global corporate executive at Bertelsmann, Berendt, and PSEG. And I'll let her kind of give a little bit of her background, but also share a little bit about her perspective on what it takes to thrive on risk. So with not much delay and ado, I'll let get Andrea to kind of give her perspective. Andrea, over to you. And Thank you. go ahead, please. Thank you so much, Gunjan. And it's really great to be with such a great group of uh, very diverse and geographically diverse people. So I really appreciate being part of this. Um, you know, my background is someone who grew up in Europe and for 17 years came to the U.S. and then uh, living in New York City, traveling the world on um, um, business most of the time, but sometimes pleasure, uh, working in many different countries. Uh, my first job as a corporate executive was general counsel of an international power company. I was investing in many different parts of the world, some of them very challenging from a uh, 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 standpoint, uh, environmental health and safety issues, etc. And so starting with, with that role, I started looking at risk 
as something that we needed to take care of and have an enterprise risk management program of some kind. Um, I'm hearing a lot of feedback. I don't know. Maybe yeah, no, I see the feedback as well. I'm not yeah. sure what we can do about it. Through, but I'll, yeah. I'll keep talking. I'll keep talking. Can, can we mute other people? You know, let's all mute. Who I think that's, I think that'll work. Great. Um, I'll do the same when I don't speak. Um, so, so really looking at, um, you know, the context that you're working in, you're, you're traveling in, that you are investing in, um, and really understanding the context, not just the risk. So one of the things that I did, uh, subsequently, I, I spent, um, about 18 years in, in corporate roles, um, sometimes chief risk ethics, uh, corporate responsibility, and then cybersecurity as well. When I started my business, I basically wanted to help board members and management understand risk, understand what it meant to know what your risks are and plan for them. And that that whole process that you just described, Gunjan, of getting to a place of knowledge and thriving on risk, uh, I call it transforming risk into value because when you know your risk, you can create you can protect, first of all, your stakeholders and your and your assets, but you can also create value because you create better products and services. So being blind to risk doesn't allow you to make those better products and services. And so this has been sort of a constant theme in everything that I do. And I, uh, in my own uh, in my own practice, you can tell I'm in New York City. There's a bunch of sirens. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but we'll be resilient and move forward here. Uh, so. Um, one of the things that, that I don't think executives and boards do well enough is understand the connection of risk to value and risk to opportunity uh, and risk to resilience. And so I've been trying to target boards and management uh, to get them to understand that this is really an important part of their equation. And so I do a lot of writing and speaking and training and educating of boards and management and I wrote something, my most recent piece is an ebook that's called the ESG and T Megatrends Manual. And it's the ESG piece, which has also been missing all these years as a, as a sort of a portfolio approach to, you know, don't just know what your financial and operational risks are, know what your environmental, social governance. And I've added a T for technology. And for those of you in California, a hotbed of technological change. Um, that is a, uh, a, a crucial component of what companies need to think about. Even when they're not tech companies, they may have AI ethics issues. They certainly have cybersecurity issues. So there are all these tech issues. And so the mega trends that I, that I pointed out in my recent piece um, really talk about technological disruption at the speed of light, talk about how we are going through a deficit of leadership and institutional trust, which also is the context that creates risk. A third uh, uh, category of megatrend that I talk about is um, the fact that there's a rise in complex interconnected risks, something that the World Economic Forum has talked about, um, where all these big categories of risk influence each other and, and, and um, you know, interconnect with each other, whether it's the pandemic interconnected with biological issues, interconnected with social justice issues, and so on and so forth. The fourth one is geopolitical tectonic shifting, which we have been seeing for the last few years for sure and can, will continue to see uh, the big powers of the world and also the alliances. And then last but not least, the rise of stakeholder capitalism, which also creates a whole bunch of risks for business, but also a whole bunch of opportunities. So I don't want to overstay my welcome. Uh, those are my initial thoughts and uh, happy to turn it back over to, to Gunjan to continue to facilitate. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Gunjan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. And that was great uh, comments there. Uh, and with that, let me let me turn over to uh, Francois Javier. If you can give a little bit of your perspective all the way from Paris. I know we, we are a real multinational team here uh, sharing a perspective. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. And just to give a little background uh, on uh, Francois in terms of he's been an entrepreneur in insurance, insurance tech right enabling facilitating and access to insurance solutions globally uh, he has had a lot of experience as a chief risk officer uh, with a long history of working in the insurance industry which is a critical piece of how you shift you know uh, the risk from one party to another party and uh, the concepts of reinsurance management insurance actuarial science project management and finance and all coming together in enterprise risk management these are topics which are very near and dear to him 
So I'll let him kind of speak to his perspective on what it takes to help the world thrive on risk. So uh, over to you, Francois. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Gunjan. Uh, that, that's a great pleasure to, to be with you today, uh, definitely uh, on that topic also, which is uh, very dear to me. As you said, uh, with my my own um, life and path, uh, the risk has been approached m- mainly from an actuarial point of view. So more figures at the start of my uh, career, uh, working in different companies and understanding what are the risks. After a few years, I uh, decided to understand from another perspective and shifting to a micro the microfinance sector and I. I worked uh, eight years in India more and, and that uh, and that kind of field, setting up um, micro insurance and uh, products. Uh, so more of a grassroots level, and that gave me another perspective, not only of what uh, the, the the risk can be felt, obviously in a such uh, um, conditions of life, you know, very poor. Uh, working, uh, I was working with teams in uh, different slums in Maharashtra in India, for example, and that gave up obviously another perspective of the fragility and and how one can deal with risk in such situations so uh, then I, I shift back I shifted back to to France and worked uh, as a uh, as a chief risk officer of um, uh, one of the major uh, insurance company here in uh, in France with 26 billion of euros in management so it was very financial you know here the context was very not micro finance but more macro and uh, Working on the on the different uh, issues related to interest rates and uh, and the markets and uh, obviously when you look at risk it's always the same thing. What do we name? Do we try to protect something that we are breeding or that we are cultivating, or are we trying to hunt because we we are as we said uh, we have some appetite to thrive uh, for 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 some prosperity somehow is some freedom that is willing to express you know in a given framework and that's true for individuals that's true for companies uh how how do we how do we appreciate that i think the best example is obviously what we've we've just gone through with this with this covid um this is a similar shock for everyone and everyone felt it differently uh, everyone looked at it with its culture, its age, its um, where it was, and uh, the, the the pain it went through, and uh, in his own network. So many lessons we could observe a lot. Everybody has learned a lot uh, in that way. For me, that's the best, the biggest uh, common risk management experience that the world went through. When I say risk management, it's, it's not just like a risk that we went through. We went, especially in Europe, in many different risks. But that's to me uh, a very big lesson to um, to analyze in terms of uh, the diversity of responses that was given from one place to another because of the governances, because of um, the uh, uh, investment, the decisions that were taken. And obviously we will see, and it's very early to, 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 to look at that, what uh, in terms of risk management, uh, best practices that we could take out of that. It's difficult to, to judge that now because... Um, some have borrowed a lot, so obviously you can see uh, an emerging in two, three, four years some kind of uh, debt crisis felt as a perceived as a future risk, uh, an important one. Obviously, it, just after the, the immediate uh, risk, we, we we have the climate issues and the uh, inequality, inequality that will arise also out of the uh, diversity of. Uh, of uh, risk management of that COVID because the, the countries will be very different. Uh, the situation, the economic situations from one place to another will be very different. The generations will be different. Youth and uh, the youth of yesterday and the youth of today, the, the, the appetite uh, and uh, the opportunities that were given to them is very different. So uh, I like it. I, I mean, the ESG, as you, as you propose, as a, as a framework is definitely uh, the acknowledgement of some common understanding, like the COVID has been one understanding that we had all to share urgently. So ESG is another kind of framework that we need to have in mind, in order at least to align on what's there. And then after we can think of how to stimulate solutions, how to uh, promote uh, certain initiatives while trying to, uh, you know, scout for new ideas, um, it can be startups, it can be people with that. We, we can definitely share the problem uh, may, need, may not we, we should maybe not share the solutions. I mean to say we need to promote people for finding the the, the solution and scale uh, for that. I mean that's that's just what I wanted to say for now. 
Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Franchon. Great thoughts there. And we'll build upon that as we go into uh, uh, further conversation here. Uh, but with me, with that, let me turn over to Mayor Patricia Locke Dowson. And, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, with her uh, advocacy and governmental affair work, you know, she's, you know, been an American politician serving as the 18th mayor of Riverside, California, which is one of the, what, 58th uh, largest cities in country out of over 2,000 cities around the United States. But I think what was remarkable in the 150 year history of the city, she is the second female mayor. And that to me is an amazing, amazing, uh, you know, feat and landmark. And, and, and that's, that, you know, speaks to her accomplishment, but it also touches upon the very issue of ESG. And I'll, I'll let you kind of speak to the whole topic on how are we going to be changing that into the future as we think about the social aspects. When I look at gender diversity as a topic within the social uh, aspect, I'd like you to also touch upon what it takes for businesses, governments, and the society at large to actually see this as a performance uh, enhancer in terms of how we think about diversity as a tool, not just for social justice, not just for social equity, but to actually build a better performing government and business uh, ecosystem over time. So I'll let you share your thoughts on thriving on risk, but please, please also touch upon your journey and what it is to be, you know, the second female uh, mayor in Riverside, California, and, and what advice you would have for, for all of us to be able to actually bring diversity to the forefront. So please go ahead. Wow, I think we only have 45 minutes in this whole session, so I will <laughs> I will try to be as brief as I can, but thank you, Gundan, and thanks everybody for being here today and for inviting me. I, I feel very honored to be part of this distinguished panel. Um, you're right, I've spent two decades in government. Riverside is the 58th largest city out of 20,000 cities in the United States. We're the 12th largest city in the state of California, so we're pretty large. So it is surprising we have only had one other female mayor, and she was very short-lived in, in the history of the city. Um, I think as a, as a government, we our risk management is often different from the private sector, right? Because we, we come from things from an environmental risk, um, social unrest, um, gender inequality. I mean, all these social issues are things that are put upon government officials to solve, right? So this is the space we've been working in forever, but... It's also, um, I think, different than, than in that we still have to worry about economic, um, thriving economics, right, of our regions and our municipalities. And I think Andrea touched on this, too. You can't talk about this without um, things being interconnected, though. You know, the, the economic crisis portends civil unrest, which portends, um, you know, that's related back to income inequality and wealth disparities, and I think those are all really big things. And to your point, Gunjan, we can use diversity in our boards, commissions, our elected bodies, our leadership within our uh, private businesses to be able to bring a diverse set of solutions to the table, right? And I do think I've often been the only woman in an elected body or board, and um, just by virtue of my perspective, I will bring up different issues which then, of course, result in different types of solutions. So, and I think having studies um, that show us that bottom lines often improve by having a diversity of personalities and people at the table. And I'll just close with saying um, one thing we hear a lot about in the private sector, and I think who's in Silicon Valley today? I think it's you, Gunjan. Aren't you up in you're up in the Bay Area today? Yes. I think, right at yes. California. And so we hear all the time that companies want diversity, want diversity, want diversity, want diversity, yet they say they can't access talent. Well, we have a university here, one of the top universities globally, University of California at Riverside. Over 58% of our um, STEM, STEM um, graduates are people of color, are students of color. They're either Latino or um, black, um, various other uh, groups, women. So we don't see the connection, though, between businesses looking to where the talent is being grown. And I think that's where we could have more um, solutions come out of that. So I'll stop there, but uh, I yeah. could go on. But I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, uh, 
the other city. No, Thank you. W- wonderful. Uh, and, and Mayor Patricia, great comments there. And we'll build upon that. And I just want to add, you know, as you were talking about gender diversity, uh, you know, one of the stats that came to my mind as you were speaking was a report recently that I saw from SNP Global Market Intelligence Research Team. And they actually studied from 2002 to 2019 all the public companies CFOs from where they actually had a female CFO. And what was remarkable to me was the companies that were run by the female CFOs generated $1.8 trillion more in gross profit than the sector average, which is remarkable. So companies with female CFOs experienced bigger stock price re- returns relative to firms with male CFOs during the executive's first 24 month in the role. That's the analysis. So, the, so the, the point I'm trying to kind of underscore here is we do these things not just for social justice, clearly that's a driver, but we also do this to raise performance because evidence is a lower that diversity actually raises performance, whether it's in government, business, society, or across the board. And we've got to be able to bring that to the discussion here as we l- learn about how to thrive on risk. So great conversation. And, and Mayor Patricia, you're an inspiration for us to be able to see this uh, in the office. With that, let me turn over to uh, Matthew George, uh, who's the chief executive of Vigit Trust. Uh, he is the CEO and founder of Vigit Trust. Uh, he's built this company over the last almost 18 plus years. Uh, and he's, it's in, he's an established authority in IT security and risk management with over 20 years of experience. His expertise includes areas like PCI, you know, GDPR, which is very, very important these days with privacy topics, CCPA, HIPAA, and all the other privacy regulations. And he's worked very closely with the PCI Council in US and Europe. And he's also the current president and chief security officer of the French Irish Chamber of Commerce. And he served on, on the, as the chairman of InfoSecurity uh, Ireland and was an official reviewer of, for ANSI, the standards body. So I just will turn it over to Matthew to talk about his view, especially looking at it from the information security and IT security risk perspective as you think about the world moving forward, especially with all the rise of the cyber crimes and all the attacks and ransomware, you know, it's getting the headline every day, as you know, uh, which has recently happened here. How do you think about the world learning to thrive on risk? Thank you very much, Kanjan, and uh, delighted to be part of this uh, panel with uh, my other um, uh, panelists here. Um, nice to meet you all. Um, so, uh, I, as you said, I've been in risk uh, for uh, over 20 years. And the way I look at risk is by looking at what I call bubbles of risks. Um, and so I see four major bubbles uh, that, that I work from. The first one is geopolitical risk. Um, a couple of examples uh, that you may or may not uh, associate with geopolitical risk, but for instance, um, uh, Brexit uh, is very disruptive from a data protection perspective. And for companies that had decided to be headquartered in the UK, they had to review the overall risk from a data protection. That is something that they probably hadn't planned to do. Um, then we look at the, the finance and contractual risk, uh, financial contractual risk. Then I look at the uh, brand management and reputation risk, which is really, really big. And, and, and when you talk about social governance, you also need to, 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 to look at the, uh, at the reputation. And then eventually IT and ICT risk, which to some extent is probably the easiest part to deal with because there are some very good solutions out there that, that can allow you to uh, reduce the risk, which leads me on to the, the question, what can we do with risk? So there's only a few things we can do with risk. We can ignore the risk and that you shouldn't do that. That's a bad thing to do. You can uh, transfer the risk, but when you transfer the risk, you only transfer the operational aspect of the risk or some aspect of the risk, you don't actually transfer the ownership of the risk. Um, You can reduce the risk by mitigating that risk with technical solutions, policies, training, awareness, and so on. And then you eventually end up with a risk that you have to decide to either accept or not accept. And if you accept the risk, that's where we go into that three-step approach that you mentioned, which is we manage the risk, we embrace the risk, and we, we try to thrive with that risk. But I, I'd like to go back on on the point that Andrea mentioned earlier on about 
the, 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 the board and the C-level folks that actually need to understand risk. Um, uh, for my sins, I've actually uh, uh, published a book called The Cyber Elephant in the Boardroom, um, which really deals with <coughs> educating board members on understanding the risk and the cyber accountability. And uh, I, I think that if you don't look at the risk as being the ownership of the key decision makers to start with, to drive the strategy, you, you, you're going to increase your risk surface tremendously. And then finally, the other point that I w wanted to make was the idea of personal risk for people. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, we spoke about that earlier on, but it's all about um, uh, the wealth, your health, your ability to travel, your liberties being curtained by, by, because of the pandemic. And then also at the same time, the rise of IoT and everything being connected, increasing your risk surface in such a way that I as an individual need to protect my own critical infrastructure protection, not just the, the colonial pipeline or the health service executive in, in Ireland. I have my own infrastructure to protect. And so all of this is creating a lot of new risk that I don't think everyone is necessarily aware of or trained to deal with. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Matthew. And this is, you know, kind of opens up for further, you know, discussion. And, and one of the topics that I, I want to kind of raise here, and given that, you know, we have such an esteemed panel of, uh, of experts here on, on this topic of thrive and risk, one of the questions that comes to my mind always is, what is the blind spot? You know, you go back to February 2020, right? We were oblivious. I was in blue trotting back then. I was in London. I was in New Delhi. I was all over the place. And the world looked just normal. And then one fine day, I still remember I landed into uh, in London, and it was eerie silence there on 8th of March 2020. And I knew something was off. Uh, but the question that I have for all of you is, where do you think the shoe drops? Where do you think risk comes from? And where is a blind spot that we are not attending to the way we should be attending to? And I know it's a loaded question, but I'll, I'll have Andrea open this up and, and then we can go around uh, in, this, in the same order to just hear your perspective. Are there some lessons that we learned from the pandemic you know, over the last year? And, and where, what should we be paying attention to from here onwards so that we learn and we actually learn to thrive on risk? So go ahead, go ahead, Andrea. What, what a great question. Um, I, I, I will answer it in two levels. The first level is the personal level. Um, and I remember reading this, uh, some risk expert, um, or actually spoke at a conference years ago, and it really resonated with me. And it's that most human beings are not wired to think about long-term risk. We may be wired to protect ourselves from crossing the street and getting a car hitting hit us, but we're not wired to think about things like climate change or pandemics, even though once they happen, they're very fast. But they're, you know, it takes time to prepare for these things and to be ready for these things. And I think it's incumbent, this last year has made it clear that it's incumbent on every sector of society, whether it's business, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the nonprofit world or uh, government agencies, obviously. Uh, and there's a real public-private um, uh, collaboration requirement in today's world because we are in a time of both existential risk and long-term risk and the need for sustainability. So there's a, a real conglomeration of things happening right now that require all of us to collaborate with each other. Uh, and it's not just climate, it's cyber issue, I think is, is huge in this regard. And finally, we're getting some government uh, stepping up to uh, dealing with this issue and investing money. Um, but I think that the other blind spots, that's the personal piece is that most people aren't wired to, um, to think about risk, except maybe very short term. Some of us are wired for long term, and those are the ones of us who are in risk management, I think, is because we do think about crisis and preparing for it and resilience building and all that. Um, the second piece is the board in business. Uh, and I think the same applies to leadership in other sectors, um, but especially in business, boards have been lagging behind like crazy. And I think it goes back to Mayor Patricia's point before about lack of diversity. You don't have diverse minds and experiences at the very top of an organization holding the CEO and management accountable for thinking about risk. Nobody's thinking about risk until it hits them in the face. 
And so um, to me, that's the biggest blind spot. And I, I've dedicated my last 10 years or so to trying to get boards to think about this as their responsibility to oversee and, and demand accountability from the CEO and not just give them incentives to get the most money. Anyway. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks, Andrea. Great points. And Francois, let, let's hear your thoughts on this same topic here. Uh, but that was very, very germane. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I think uh, the, 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 uh, as Andrea said, it's, it's very obviously uh, the, the systems that we have plugged, we always feel that there is a rhythm, you know, in business. You know, there is the yearly exercises. We, we plug new projects. We set up new roads, new uh, digital uh, systems, infrastructures, and, and they are there to, to last, right? And when it comes to something like this, we just discover that this has to be unplugged, this has to be unplugged, and that uh, creates a tremendous uh, impact uh, um, that uh, we, we, we just discussed before with Mathieu, who was just uh, rightly saying, uh, and all, all the impacts that we are not so well prepared for. So if you think about ESG, obviously, uh, that would be exactly the same thing. What, be, what should we uh, unplug, you know, in, in such, if we want to really fight for that, uh, for that uh, risk, uh, are we waiting for like uh, the frog in uh, uh, this uh, this water, which is uh, slowly cooking, or are we just really considering things and, and take the right decisions? So uh, the, that's on on what we missed. I think it's it's very much about that. I think there is also um, what we we were showing and what we are discussing with uh, Mayor Patricia before when she was saying that there are lots of. Uh, um, combination of uh, of components when you look at the way the, uh, the, the this COVID has been managed, understood from uh, Africa to Asia, India, uh, Europe, and even in Europe, we had a lot of diversity. Um, I, I feel that um, there, there is a different acceptance also of, uh, of the risk, where some are ready to play, some are not playing so much, and that, that uh, that everyone didn't understand that at the same at the same pace, and we that that's that's how I would I would say I think this framework comes true when there is some data and when there is some acknowledgement. We had pandemics before, and we didn't do that much because we had different mean, means of getting cured. Right, we were not relying on public systems at that time. Now people have relied a lot more on these infrastructures. And because we have these infrastructures taking care of health, I think it has changed the, the whole uh, the whole management of the crisis. Wonderful. All right. No, that's great points there. So let me turn over that with uh, with Mayor Patricia for your comments and thoughts on, you know, so what do you see as from your vantage point, some of the blind spots that, you know, might in front of all of us that you want to share here. So. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, um, I think, uh, Francois pointed to some things that I think of when I think of the different cultural, uh, the differences in cultures between countries and how that impacts our risk um, tolerance and our risk perception, right? And so I can only really speak to the U.S. and specifically the California because that's what I focus on so much. But um, I think one of the blind spots that we have now, um, I mean, you often don't know what you don't know. But I think we know things, and I think we are ignoring them willfully. And one of them in the United States is wealth disparity, right? And wealth disparity, and now it's been, um, we're seeing it play out before us with homelessness and the homeless crisis we have, particularly here in California. We have encampments growing everywhere. We have, you know, these problems. That is that is building to a crescendo that nobody is really, I mean, we're all trying to address it. We're all trying to fix it. But I don't think anybody can really anticipate what the implications of this will be if it continues on the path that it is. Um, it's going to, of course, lead to civil unrest. I think that's one of my biggest fears. Um, and, you know, it's more division. But uh, this this is what keeps me up awake at night is this this thing. <laughs> Wonderful. And that's a great perspective. And, and as, as I said, you know, this is not just the responsibility of governments, but this is the responsibility of businesses as part of the ESG imperative to think about how social equity, wealth distribution, you know, there's fairness and then there, there is actual participation from government, from businesses across the globe, from boardrooms participating in helping drive for more equitable wealth distribution. So great points there. 
So, uh, Matthew, do you want to add to your perspectives on where you think the next shoe drops or how it, uh, what's your perspective on it and what can we learn from the pandemic that, you know, we just experienced last 12 months? So I think that um, stating the, the obvious, this was the first time that we had um, a crisis that was global, that was affecting health, wealth, ability to travel, ability to work and completely reshaped the way we were actually spending our days. Um, and so, uh, yes, but, 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 you know, as a, as a company, um, maybe you had uh, a plan for um, a, wealth, a, a health crisis. Maybe you had a plan whereby your executives couldn't travel. Maybe you had a plan for something else, but very few had a plan for an actual p pandemic. And so I agree with what was said earlier on that, um, we were maybe taking everything for granted. And I think you said it yourself uh, that, that, you know, you wake up one day and your way of life is gone uh, the way you knew it, you know. And I don't know that it will ever come back exactly the same way. And it probably shouldn't come back exactly the same way because we need to talk about um, risk tolerance and risk appetite for tomorrow. And I think that if we want to do social governance the right way we need to try and and have a look at what what will life be in 30 40 years time so we already know that there's going to be probably one billion more people on the planet that will have to be housed will have to be looked after educated uh, will be working with us and they'll all be connected imagine that a um, amazing new risk surface that criminals and, and, and others can, can use. I think we need to start thinking about that as we grow uh, the, the economy and as we rebuild the education system, because if we don't, we're going to miss a trick. Well, but it's not a science, though. You know, it's not all bad news. I think we collectively we have the expertise. No, and, and I think I would, I would, you know, kind of say that, that there's always some goodness that comes out of the crisis. I actually wrote a blog in March last year called The Silver Lining of COVID. And, and, I, and I genuinely feel that, and, and I go back to history, you know, sitting here in Silicon Valley, I would say, you know, we, we tend to be optimists, especially technology optimists, because we believe technology has the answer in some ways to solve problems in the world. But I go back to history here a little bit, you know, after the World War II, you know, 1945 was the Geneva Convention that came together, the world came together to kind of reflect on what went on and how it affected the world. And, the, and it was done by one person, by the way. If you go back to the history, it was not done by UN or by anything else. This guy's name was Jean Pictet. He was a Swiss national. One person took the lead to create what's known today as the 1945 Geneva Convention, the modern definition of war, which basically changed the way we look at war in the modern times and uh, and the world has adhered to it. So by coming back, sitting here in 2021, I would like all of us to think about, you know, what's the takeaway here in terms of are, are there new definitions, new standards, new taxonomy, new vocabulary, whether it's ESG that needs to be redefined, that basically sets forth the future and what's that takeaway that needs to come out, whether it's a, at the level of the government coming out, whether it's level at the businesses, but to me, that's the takeaway, you know, that I would like to suggest that we should be part of our Thrive and Risk mission. And um, but I was very encouraged when I first read this little piece from about the World War II. When we sit forth what we experienced last one year, this was an attack on humanity by the virus. And uh, and we need to learn something from it so that we can better prepare ourselves for the future to ahead of us. So I'll, we have five more minutes. I'd like any concluding remarks from anyone else here. So uh, I'll just open up the floor for any one of you uh, to, uh, to add any points to, to the discussion here. Please go ahead. I'll just jump in uh, with a coda to what you just said, which I think is exactly correct. We are living at a moment of conglomeration of both existential and really large risks. Uh, the geopolitical, the cyber, technology, pandemics, more pandemics, uh, certainly climate change. So all this is coming together and it came together in one big, ugly year that we've just come through, which part of the world is still going to be going through for a while. We need to learn lessons from this. And I really feel there was something happening uh, captured by the words stakeholder capitalism or capitalism with a human face, which I really think has to become the norm where uh, governments and businesses are working together 
uh, to solve some of these problems. The governments are not responsible for everything, uh, but they're also not responsible for next to nothing. And so we need to work together on these resilience building measures that help uh, society. And so I think there's a real opportunity, not just in the US, but globally uh, to start doing that. And I just saw this morning MasterCard Foundation is giving $1.5 billion to pandemic efforts in Africa. Hooray for them. Hooray for Africa. I mean, this is the kind of thing that has to happen. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Wonderful. Any other concluding remarks, uh, uh, Mayor Patricia, from your vantage point? Thank you. I think to um, Andrea's point, uh, the government can't do it alone, really. I mean, we, we are tasked with solving these things, but these things are just too large and big and ugly. And we need innovation. And so much of that innovation comes out of the private space. And I think partnering is the way we're going to, um, you know, look to the future and see a more positive, opportunistic future and, and move towards that together. And in fact, our city is our, we just finished our strategic plan for the next 20 years. And it's all about triple bottom line. The entire strategic plan has cross cutting threads and they all do that, but we won't be able to achieve that without help from private sector and the public as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Francho, anything, any concluding remarks from you? Sure, sure. I, I, as you said, I mean, what do we feel when we, we, we thrive in risk? You know, it's like we, we are really focusing. I mean, that's the feeling I can express, for example, when I'm just downhill skiing, you know, you're, you're really doing uh, your sport. You take the risk of downhill skiing, but at the same time, you got to be very aware of what's going on and where you are and you enjoy that risk in a way. So here, how to, be, to build up that kind of a feeling when we hear whatever we've been saying so far, diversity is definitely a a must when we talk about the governance is like to make sure that everyone has a voice and we do our our activity because we see everyone around so it's not just uh, statistics right and uh, it, it's true that today in this context of uh, uh, a big lockdown at the same time there is more digital connection uh, it's a risk as uh, we were said uh, with um, uh, with the platform but i think it's also an opportunity to seize in order to ensure some proper data and some proper uh, uh, understanding without fake news. We talk about real data. And that's what is uh, the measure of the temperature today. Or that's what uh, the social uh, divide is today. So on yeah. that basis, you know, that's what we, 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 we need to share together. And everyone then obviously has to take his own decision with his own uh, know-how. Wonderful. All right, thank you. And final words from you, Matthew, before we are at the top of the hour now. Please go ahead. Yeah, so I, I think that I always look at um, securing something as a journey and not a destination. And I think we need to remain on that journey. There will be a few pit stops along the way where we can get together, we can take stock, we can uh, write lessons learned, we can make sure that we implement the, the lessons that we've learned. But we need to do this on a continuous basis. We can't just say, okay, we've learned from COVID, we've taken corrective action, and now it's back to normal. We actually need to make sure that we learn to make that process a continuous process to address the risk and to be able to thrive with it. Wonderful. And this is, you know, a really good way to finish. And I, I want to make a fun comment towards the end as we are concluding it. You know, I remember reading the book, Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus. Uh, and, and I'm just thinking about that book because I feel at some level the governments have been sitting on Mars and businesses have been sitting on Venus. You know, I think the time has come to put them on the same planet. And I think we will do that through technology, through data, through communication and, and collaboration and dialogue and bringing diversity and inclusiveness together. So that's all. And thank you all for being here today. It was a great conversation. I learned a lot and I'm sure this is something that, you know, our audience would pick up some good nuggets from. So thank you all for your thank time you. today. Thank, thank you so much. much. Take care. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.